speakers who will give you an overview of what delegates can expect at the event this year. Something Chairing the panel is Ambassador Pele, Chairman of the Institute of South Asian Studies, and with him, uh, Professor Tan Tayong, Director of the Institute and Vice Provost of NUN, Mira Chan, prolific writer, prolific writer, sorry, and uh, an active player in the local literary scene, and Mr. Shahid Burki, Senior Visiting Research Fellow at ISS and former VP of the World Bank. The panelists will provide an overview, after which they will take questions from all of you. Um, let me hand over to um, Ambassador Pillay now. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to see all of you, and I'm thankful to you for being here uh, on a working day in the morning in a somewhat remote place, Singapore, there are remote places, this is one of them, uh, with no MRT connections and everything else, but you still managed to come, and I'm very grateful. Uh, first, I want to introduce, which uh, Nina has already done, the people on the panel and why they're here. And then I want to introduce some of my other colleagues who are sitting in the audience. Uh, who uh, participates in this, uh, in this uh, convention. First on my right is Professor Tan Tai Yong. Uh, he's the director of ISAS and the Moving Spirit of the Institution. Then we have Mira. Mira represents, as, uh, as Dina said, you know, the, the art and media and the literature part of it. She's a prolific writer and does what Dina said. And we are very happy to work, and this is the first time we are having this setting in the convention. Then, Mr. Javed Gurki, he's very well known in our newspapers and so on. And for regional integration, he is our evangelist, because I think he's written more, he has spoken more on this subject, and uh, we thought we would have him, him as a, one of the spokesmen. Now, I want to very quickly go through the front. Uh, Mr. Dr. Narayan, he's head of research. Uh, Mr. Riyas Khan, one of the senior fellows. Uh, Pro uh, Dr. Iftika Chowdhury, uh, who is a former foreign minister and now principal research person. And then our director, uh, Mr. Kirja Pandey, who I you know I'm speaking of his company. I, I always think of him as Tata and something. <laughs> but he's now chairman of Avlock. So that the name. I was thinking of your name, I think of the company. Then you have other senior colleagues here, uh, Johnson, Preeti, Sitara, Rekha, and so on. So these are the, the staff that we have. A uh, very quick word on ISAS. ISAS was started in 2004, but as soon as we were started, we hit the ground running. Uh, we were first able to entrap the director, Tan Tai Yong, who came for six months, but after seven years, he's still here. Then we entrapped the head of research, Mr. Uh, Mr. Nara, Dr. Narayan. Dr. Narayan has been wanting to, to walk into the sunset, but uh, every time he does that, I call him, he's on the way to Tirupati. He, he cannot say no to me. So, he's, so that's uh, the... We have been very lucky in that we have a very tight program, very good program with very many, very distinguished people. Now these distinguished people are coming because of the scholars that we have. Most of them are part of the network of the scholars that I said that scholar. And I think we're very lucky to have this. I must also mention that uh, apart from the scholars, uh, no institution succeeds unless it has got a very good admin group, and that we have. And I have a great deal of respect for them, but because they have the ability to stomach the impatience of an old channel and come back next day smiling. This is unique, and I'm very thankful to them for all the good work that they've done. So this is on ISAS. Now on the convention and the program. South Asian Diaspora Convention. First, a word of South Asia. This is relatively a new term. South Asia never existed until very recently. You go back in time as part of history. What existed 
was what the Persians used to call Hindustan. And Hindustan doesn't mean land of Hindus, but the land east of Indus River. It was a regional concept rather than a religious concept. That's how it started. Then Hindustan became Indian, and this region had two transformational uh, experiences. One was the coming of Islam. Second was the coming of the Europeans. Now, with their cultural, common cultural heritage, plus Islam and the European coming and dealing with the region as one, there was a very strong common thread that went through the region. And from that, in the last 60 years, 60, 70 years, this well-knitted fabric was started to fray and everybody decided that they are distinct from their neighbor. So you have a situation where you emphasize your differences rather and disregard your common thread. That's what happened to the region. But now there is a change. There is a slow emerging feeling that South Asia has a common identity. It has certain common problems. It has, if stuck together, they can produce some good results. And therefore, we felt that this was a good time for the South Asian uh, region to be once again be focused as a region. Now, the fractious atmosphere in politics in South Asia. The political, con one of the good things that has happened in South Asia is what, over the last few years, there has been greater representative government and fewer dictators. Less dictators, maybe no dictators, but some lurking around. But generally, it was a participative government. Now, in this sort of situation, the the electorate is very important. So each country starts pandering to their electorate and therefore very reluctant to change their ways. So 60, 70 years of venom that has come out to spoil this fabric that was for thousands of years that existed is still difficult. But we felt the way to get this fabric woven again, re-establish the thread, was through the diaspora. Because the diaspora, they're brilliant people, they are very successful people who went out and they don't carry that much of baggage. And that is why we have the South Asian Diaspora Convention. The actual uh, idea of having it in Singapore actually originated by, uh, from our last president, the sixth president of Singapore, Mr. Asana. He is the first one to tell me that, look, Singapore is an excellent venue, a platform uh, for South Asians, South Asian diaspora from various parts to, to assemble and then to, to discuss, interact and so on. So that is the background of this convention. Now, in this convention, there are several programs and Professor Tan will go into the details of this. But I just want to highlight one or two things. One, in the last convention, we concentrated basically on policy and as well as on academic subjects. This time, there is a greater emphasis on business, arts and media literature, and we have a number of interactive sessions, which makes it much more interesting. We have a very packed program. I'm just a little worried, uh, you know, how we are going to push it through in two days. And we also have uh, launching of books or release of books, and three of them. One is a seminal work by ISAS on the South, on the Sri Lankan diaspora, and then there's a book on painting by uh, uh, ex artist. He's no more, but his son is launching the book. And then, of course, McKinsey's report. I think Tayong will mention all this. I think Mira will talk about uh, the cultural power. And then Javed will tell you about the, the concept of integration, regional integration, why it should be. 
I think two days ago there was a newspaper report that said that just in India alone, because of the fall of the rupee, the remittances will increase because more people will send money back. So from 69 billion last year, it will go up to 71 billion this year, 2013. So you can see the potential. But let me not hog the stage and hog the mic. I will now pass it on to Professor Santa Young, my colleague, to carry on with the program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, now, some of you uh, in this room who are not familiar with uh, the work done by ISS and maybe uh, by the National University of Singapore may query why uh, there is an interest in Singapore on the South Asian diaspora. Um, why are we uh, leveraging so much uh, effort on creating this awareness and organizing these big events? But if you look at um, what's been coming out of the National University of Singapore and ISIS in the last few years, uh, you realize that um, gradually, slowly but surely, Singapore has been building a reputation uh, and visibility as an intellectual and social center of the worldwide South Asian diaspora. Now, scholars uh, have been brought together and produced several important studies of the Indian and South Asian diaspora from Singapore including the very seminal Encyclopedia of the Indian Diaspora that was published in 2006. So for a few years now, uh, NUS, the National University of Singapore, and ISIS have gradually been building this reputation. At the Institute of South Asian Studies, we have had several meetings of uh, world experts on the South Asian Diaspora and are gradually producing also many important studies, important books dealing with the subject. Chairman has already mentioned um, a follow-up to the Encyclopedia of the Indian Diaspora, and this is an Encyclopedia of the Sri Lankan Diaspora, and this is the first ever attempt at producing a comprehensive Encyclopedia dealing with the Sri Lankan Diaspora. So, another pioneering work from ISIS. Now, Singapore has also become home to a very vibrant South Asian community. New migrants have created a bus in Singapore, and we believe that this positions Singapore well as a uh, location where you know, um, business, intellectual, social, educational engagement can take place uh, with, the South, with the South Asian region and connecting the South Asian region with the global diaspora. And this was the impetus and the inspiration that led us to organize the first South Asian uh, diaspora convention in 2011. And as Chairman has already mentioned, I think the, the inspiration behind this was also our former president, Mr. S. R. Nandan, who told us of this opportunity. So we did that in 2011. Some of you who covered the event might remember that it was a fairly successful event. We got about 1,000 um, participants. It was um, a good engagement uh, involving a range of people. And in fact, um, arising from that, some of the participants were so encouraged that they told us that we should constitute this as an annual or as a regular event. So they said, don't give up, this, this is a good thing, and if you should do this on a regular basis, very soon you will acquire a reputation and people will congregate here, and you should try to position this, and this is a phrase used by one of our participants, as possibly the divorce of South Asia. So this is our ambition and our aspiration. Um, so we are now at the cusp of SADC 2013, our second installment. But as Chairman has said, we don't want the SADC to be a strictly academic affair. We believe that we can engage the South Asian diaspora in very productive ways. <coughs> and we hope that this convention will provide a neutral and conducive platform for the global diaspora together in Singapore and then to engage the South Asian region in purposeful ways. So this is not just an academic meeting where we discuss theories and discuss concepts and then everybody goes away happy. We believe that this can lead to something that is productive and purposeful. Now from research, we already know that individuals and countries in South Asia have been engaging their diaspora, individual countries in South Asia have been engaging their diaspora and vice versa. And this thickening of these engagements 
are leading to all sorts of uh, roles that the diaspora are playing in the social and economic developments of their respective countries of origin. The most obvious examples of these are remittances and investments. But there are also growing involvement against the diaspora in generating and catalyzing social and educational initiatives, entrepreneurship, cultural efflorescence, and even philanthropy in their home countries. Indeed, this is the subject of a book that will be released by ISAS in a few weeks' time. But these are individual and group efforts emerging from within their countries in South Asia. Through the SAPC, we hope to raise this beyond the, the national level and to project the potential that the South Asian region offers as a whole. And this is what is unique about the SAPC. In other words, we are not just looking at what individual countries are doing, but we are looking at the region as a whole. Now, SADC, as the name suggests, does not focus on one individual country in South Asia, but it tries to explain why it is important to understand the potential that the region offers as an integrated entity. So we try to uh, position our panels to address uh, these themes, First, by starting by making sure that we have a range of speakers from across the region. So you will notice from our program that we have uh, very distinguished speakers from the entire region and beyond. And we will also have panels that seek to explain why South Asia is not an artificial construct. As the chairman has alluded to earlier, despite the fact that national boundaries that emerged after colonial rule and wars in the 20th century, has undermined the coherence of the region and fractured the civilizational identity of, of South Asia. So we have a panel uh, addressing the cultural underpinnings of the region, for example, the shared narratives, and I'll let uh, my distinguished colleague Meera Chan elaborate on that a little later. There is also a panel on South Asian representations in the media and the arts, the role played by arts and media in either defining an identity or fracturing it, at the ultimate session, and possibly one of the highlights of the convention, will be a, con a conversation shared by Professor Tommy Cole on global connections and visions uh, for a region. So you see, we are trying to address this whole theme or this whole idea that South Asia can be viewed as a region, not just a collection of individual countries. But we also believe that for the best, the best chance for regional integration lies in greater economic engagement among the countries. And that is why SADC 2013 will have an economics and business focus. So there will be panels on investments and capital flows, financial markets, business opportunities, as well as the sort of global opportunities offered by regionalism. And we will have a special panel by the Foundation of Indian Industries, CII, uh, where some of India's leading CEOs will come together to discuss economic prospects for India in the years ahead. But for that, I will leave to my colleague, uh, 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 Mr. Javed Berkey, to explain uh, some of this panel and the economic focus. So I will pause, I will stop here, and I'll pass the mic to uh, Mera, and then I'll be happy to take your questions uh, later on. Thank you very much. Good morning to you all. Um, I'm uh, really very, very delighted that the convention has expanded this time round to include literature and culture, the arts and, and the media. Because to me, this is a recognition of the importance that the arts play at a very deep level in underpinning and welding together the diasporic communities of Southeast Asia. Um, literature is an essential thing in giving voice to the peoples of the diaspora, in giving people also of the diaspora insight and understanding into their history, the problems and dilemmas that are faced in the diasporic space, and the weaknesses and special strengths that the people of the diaspora have. Now we live in a very transnational moment in time in which an ever-growing and expanding global population have shared the rather traumatic experience of migration, relocation, and very often 
almost always sense of displacement. And what literature does is examine uh, the migrant's experience and the effect that dislocation has on the individual and the individual's life. And in a convention such as we will be having, the sharing through discourse and dialogue of the issues literature examines to me is essential in understanding and interpreting how we negotiate our varied experiences within the diaspora. In the last decade or so, there's been an incredible explosion, uh, which I know you will all have noticed, of diasporic literature in the world. The first migration of peoples has given rise to second and third generations who have been born far from the motherland and whose links are also probably quite tenuous in many instances. And while businessmen may forge networks for commerce and investment that strengthen the diasporic communities, it's the writers and the artists who examine their roots, the journeys that have been made, and their place in their adopted countries and their unique position at the crossroads of cultures. In the diaspora also, our common collective roots, because we do have common collective roots, are sunk in very similar cultural traditions. And this allows us in many instances to overcome the differences that confront us in politics and history and to draw instead on our strengths. And in this way, literature can illuminate the many facets of the diaspora from numerous diverse viewpoints, depicting the struggle inherent in individual lives, offering solutions and compromises, and also new ways of being. I'd like to say something about the growing um, prominence of writers in the region. And as a writer myself, I know that books are the carriers of civilization, their companions, their teachers, their roads along which we travel, new experiences, and by which we understand old trauma. And literature examines the human condition and as such makes us aware of our common humanity, whatever community we may come from. And in this way, to me, diasporic literature has a very special place and a special importance, for it investigates both our past experiences and our present experiences. And it allows us to know also that we're not alone, but belong to a structured and growing community in the world with a collective common past and a very dynamic and meaningful future ahead. The recognition and the production also of South Asian literature is expanding, as I said, at a phenomenal rate. And I think this bodes very well for the future decades ahead. And I'd like to point out at this point that the very prestigious Man Booker Prize found that the growing presence <coughs> of talented diasporic, diasporic writers was so overwhelming that it set up a separate prize, the Asian Man Literary Prize, to recognize this new force of talent in the world. And recently it was announced that the Man Booker Prize itself will expand its boundaries, opening itself up to American writers. And this has caused a lot of fear that the prize will actually now be swamped by Americans and so lose value for the British and Commonwealth writers. This will probably happen, and if it does, I now see the Asian Man Literary Prize as coming into even more prominence and perspective, perspective as a showcase for South Asian literary talent, bringing diasporic writers into even greater visibility in the world. And I hope also that in this vein, other prizes will be set up that will showcase Asian talent. 
Um, there's reasons for the success of South Asian writers, both regionally and globally in the world at the moment. Um, because although diasporic writers are often far from their roots, their work is always still of interest and value <coughs> to the home audience. <coughs> By examining the negotiation of unique space they occupy in the diaspora, writers provide an illustrative lens to underlying social, historical, and economic conditions that mirror the larger realities of life in South Asia. They examine home in a way that often goes beyond the usual discourse, and in doing so, speak back to those in the home country, expanding perceptions of values and roots. And today, as you all know, a huge amount of diasporic fiction floods bookstores all over the world. And this interest has its part, uh, in part, has its um, origins in the demographic shift in Western readership. Second and third generation immigrants are demanding books they can relate to. New generations of Americans of Indian origin, Bengali Englishmen, Pakistani English women, demand books that discuss themes that involve the daily realities they face of racial discrimination and identity politics that are present for them in their diasporic space. As communities that were once monocultural become more multicultural, as intermarriage between different ethnic cultures grows, the demand for literature to explain the differences um, the differences and that unite people and also the things that unite people in their common humanity grows. And host countries also want to look into the roots of their adopted citizens to learn different ways of seeing and being. So in this way, literature heals through promoting tolerance and understanding between different communities and diverse peoples. It can also bind closer together those who do spring from a common root, yet are divided by language and custom as is on the subcontinent. And only through such tolerance can um, understanding thrive and inclusive attitudes grow in the world. And this is what I very much hope that our literature panels will do at the convention this year, bring people together in a very different uh, kind of way than business does. Um, we have um, quite <coughs> exciting people on our panel. Some of them we're waiting to, um, to confirm completely, but those um, that are coming, I would like to mention among them, Tamina Anam, who is a Bangladeshi novelist and writer who is, now lives in London. Her first novel, A Golden Age, won the 2008, 2008 Commonwealth Writers Prize for the best first book. And her second novel, The Good Muslim, was nominated for the 2011 Man Asian Literary Prize. We also have Manjushri Papa, who grew up in her native Nepal, but has lived between Canada and the USA. She writes both fiction and non-fiction. And her book, Against the the coup in Nepal, Forget Kathmandu, an elegy for democracy, was shortlisted for the Lettre Ulysses Award. And after its publication, she felt safer leaving Nepal uh, to continue um, to write against the coup and all that was happening in Nepal. So she's a very interesting person. We also have our own Singaporean Shirley Chu, well now the chair of Commonwealth and Postcolonial Studies. Um, she also is a founding editor of, uh, of a um, literary magazine called Moving Worlds, a journal in transcultural writings. Um, and on the media panel, we have Barca Dutt, who's a celebrated and very controversial television journalist who's won many national and international awards. Um, her Sunday talk show, actually, has won more awards, apparently, than any other Indian television show. And she's twice been named by the World Economic Forum on a list of global leaders 
of tomorrow. We will probably have also Manon Joseph, who is an Indian journalist and novelist, and his novel, Serious Man, was also nominated for the Man Asian Literary Prize. And we have a uh, world-famous Indian dancer, Malika Sarabhai, who is also a political activist, apart from being a wonderful dancer. And so we look forward to seeing a great variety of, of, of sessions. We have various discussions uh, that we hope will take place on the day, and they will broadly cover things such as the role of South Asian media, culture, and literature in unifying the region, the impact of external influences on how writers from South Asia write today. We'll also be asking questions such as if a common literary culture and tradition can overcome differences in politics and history. And we'll also ask if South Asian literature has helped the West to understand and overcome its cultural biases in the region. And also we'll ask what challenges writers face ahead with an audience that's both easy to please and easier also to offend in the subconscious continent. So that's, those are the kind of issues we will be talking about on our panels and I hope they will be of great interest to people, as interesting as the business uh, business panels too. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. And now call on Mr. Burki to give his presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> I'm delighted to be, uh, to be given the opportunity to participate for the second time uh, in a convention, and a very important convention, at which we will discuss uh, uh, what uh, the large diaspora community can do for, South Asia diaspora community can do for uh, the region from which they originally come. <coughs> Uh, the chairman said that this year round he would like to see the focus uh, of the convention shift from uh, some early uh, emphasis on numbers to business opportunities uh, that are being constantly created uh, as a result of what's happening in South Asia but also as a result of what the diaspora community is doing to South Asia. Uh, that will be uh, the focus of my presentation. I'm also doing a fairly uh, long paper which probably would serve as a background uh, for the convention when it is held in November. Since I'm an economist by training and a lot of experience in finance and I've always uh, banked on numbers I will use a lot of numbers to make a couple of points. But let me first make the points. Uh, one point to which the chairman has already referred is that South Asia is uh, by far the most poorly integrated region in the world. Every other region, every other major region that I can think of has come together and brought together the various economies and benefited from interaction amongst the various countries and the regions. South Asia has not done that. And the reason for that is known to everybody. It's old political disputes that just don't go away. Uh, some of us in ISAS have been working in this area and we have been suggesting that we should cast off the burdens of history and focus really on economics, where some extraordinary things are happening, uh, which are of tremendous advantage to the entire region, but also to the world. Uh, just to mention a few, uh, the enormous growth in India's IT sector, the investment it is making in the sector of health. Uh, a little known fact, and the great strides that Bangladesh has made in recent years, in liberating its women, in uh, uh, 
passing on to a new phase of demographic development which is much more uh, uh, important than all of the rest of South Asia and then becoming without any resources uh, of its own the second largest exporter of cotton textiles. And in my own country, which has been beset with all kinds of problems, uh, I believe that there are opportunities, especially if it decides to become uh, a focus of international commerce, providing land routes to India, China, the Middle East, Afghanistan, and so forth. And I believe that in all these endeavors, uh, the South Asian diasporas can play very, very significant roles. So with that as a background, now before I go uh, into detailed discussion of some of these things, uh, diasporas have been studied by economists uh, usually from one particular angle. This is the amount of money they are sending back to the countries from which they, which they, come, which they have come. The latest numbers, and I'm using the World Bank uh, estimates, is uh, something like $100 billion a year is flowing back from the various diasporas across the world back to South Asia. Uh, economists usually leave the discussion at that point. They look at it as augmentation of domestic savings, uh, which makes it possible to have, a, uh, have some increase in investment and so on. I have tried to go a little further into this by suggesting that the money that is coming in from the diaspora is having a fundamental impact on the restructuring of these societies. And in particular, the impact is on building the lower middle class. I've offered some estimates in the paper that I'm working on. Uh, my estimate is, which surprises some people, but it should not, it's not, uh, it's not unimaginable that these numbers are real numbers. Currently, the size of the middle class in South Asia is about 950 million people. It is divided almost equally between what one would call the upper middle class, people who have arrived at a stage of consumption, uh, which is somewhat parallel to those that we see in uh, more developed countries of East Asia, and the, low, and the lower middle class. Uh, again, that's about 475 million people they exist on the edge of poverty. Uh, this is the vulnerable group that can go up and down depending on what happens to the flows they receive. My own estimate is based on uh, some of the numbers uh, that keep coming in from the World Bank that this particular class is increasing in size by as much as 10 million a year. And by the year 2020, uh, the lower middle class will be skewed in, uh, sorry, the middle class will be skewed in favor of uh, the lower middle class. There'll be about 550 million people belonging to the lower middle class and about 400 and 500 million, 475 million to the upper class. Now this is important to focus on this because what's going to happen over the next few years is that enormously important profitable opportunities are going to arise in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan to satisfy the new needs of the lower middle class. Uh, people are going to stop producing everything they need at home and they will turn to the market. They will buy processed foods, they will buy simple consumer goods, they will buy motorbikes rather than travel by Tonga or on foot and so on. And we are seeing the making of a new uh, market economy based on the lower middle class. And this is an important factor which has been recognized by some, but not by all. And I think the uh, diaspora community could do well to begin to focus on some of the investments they could be making in improving re retail trade in this part of the world, in uh, uh, improving warehousing, transporting goods from one point of consumption to another point of consumption and so on. So these are uh, some of the opportunities. Let me now uh, go quickly through some of the numbers. When I was uh, writing up the notes for this presentation, I reread the paper I did for the 2011 uh, convention and I was struck by how 
much things have changed since I offered the earlier estimates. Uh, today, uh, the size of the diaspora, South Asian diaspora, is of the order of about 70 million. Uh, then I had said 50 million. The World Bank estimates that South Asians are adding 10 million people every year to the number of people living outside. Uh, this is about 25% uh, of the total number of uh, immigrants uh, that have accumulated over the last several decades as the South Asia's share is about a fourth. Uh, the diaspora per capita income ranges between $5,000 and $65,000. The higher number is for North America, particularly the United States. The U.S. per capita income is $50,000. A diaspora uh, per capita income is $65,000. So the South Asians in, uh, in North America, particularly the United States, on both East Coast and West Coast, are earning considerably more than uh, the host population. Uh, my estimate is that for the entire 70 million people of South Asian origin who are now living ab abroad, the total income every year would be of the order of $2 trillion. That's a lot of income. It is more than uh, the gross national product of India. And it, India's gross national product is produced by 1.2 billion people. $2 trillion is being produced by 70 million people. So you can imagine how productive this particular group of people are. Uh, we know from migration studies that migrants save much, much more uh, than uh, the savings done by uh, the populations in which they are living. Uh, there are many, many studies done on uh, uh, people from Kerala, people from Pakistan, people from Bangladesh living in the Middle East, working and living in the Middle East. The average savings rate for these people is 80% of their earned incomes. And most of this amount is sent back home. Very little is retained. 20% uh, is spent on just living and the rest goes back. And this has become the source of uh, poverty alleviation uh, in the countries from which these people come. Uh, and I have, as I said, estimated that we can attribute graduation of about 2 million from the poor to the lower middle class uh, uh, from this amount of flow that is occurring. Uh, for the entire diaspora, my estimate is that uh, something like uh, $300 million is being saved. Uh, about a third of this comes back to the countries from which these people came and the rest gets invested in uh, various kinds of uh, financial assets uh, that people are creating in, the, uh, in their new homes. Uh, last year, I had, uh, the year before, I had estimated the total asset base of the diaspora at 1.3 trillion. This year, uh, considering that two years have gone by and uh, the numbers continue to increase, my estimate would be that $1.5 trillion is the amount of total uh, assets created by these, uh, uh, by, by these people. Uh, in 2011, we made a proposal which had uh, some traction, but not all that. The proposal was that the diaspora community uh, could come together in various places uh, where it is easier for uh, people of these countries to meet and begin to put together new instruments of finance in order to help uh, the countries uh, generate new kinds of economies. Uh, I had some follow-up discussion with some senior leaders of finance in Singapore. Uh, they were uh, interested in the idea, but uh, I don't believe it has been pursued very much. And in a panel in which I will participate at the convention, we will uh, try and further uh, develop some, some of this. The Indians have done a very good job in creating new instruments of finance in developing parts of their economy with the help of diaspora money and diaspora skills. 
And here I'm referring to things like venture capital funds, uh, private equity funds, and various other kinds of devices. Uh, Indians are now also floating bonds uh, uh, in the community of what they call NRIs, the non-resident Indians. Uh, my view is that selecting a place like Singapore as, uh, uh, as the point where uh, the diasporas could assemble on a regular basis, uh, uh, come up with various kinds of structured finance. These are complicated instruments and they need a lot of expertise and Singapore has the expertise largely as a result of large number of Indians to a certain extent Pakistani uh, finance people having moved over here. So it is uh, it is something that uh, uh, I would recommend ISAS and its chairman to pursue with the community over here. One final point, uh, uh, some, some of my colleagues and I have begun to work on uh, what Afghanistan is going to look like uh, after the year 2014. And our view is that this presents this event, the event of U.S. pulling out uh, totally uh, from Afghanistan, presents an opportunity to the diaspora community. And let me explain why. <clears throat> I read a report uh, done by uh, Economics Intelligence Unit as to the amount of destruction that has been caused by uh, 35 years of war to the infrastructure in that country and how much it is going to cost in order to repair that. Uh, Afghanistan will have no money once the Americans leave. Uh, in addition to uh, providing for the destroyed, uh, uh, rebuilding the destroyed infrastructure, my view is uh, that diaspora should organize itself in a way that they can, that they can enter into what, what's called PPP, Public-Private Partnership, in order to raise funds to build roads, bridges, uh, pipelines, uh, various kinds of connectivity in order to make uh, South Asia a regionally homogeneous place rather than one that operates as countries and not as a region. If that were to be done, then Afghanistan could become uh, the center of commerce uh, for this part of the world, uh, with uh, commerce flowing from India to Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Central Asia, which is very rich in energy resources, with uh, uh, connection between China and the Middle East and China and Central Asia, with connection between India and Pakistan and China and so forth. So this, the northern part of South Asia, therefore, could become a very, uh, very important uh, source of uh, international commerce. And in this, the diasporas uh, have a role to play. I know when I was working uh, uh, for the World Bank in Latin America, or some of the Latin American uh, business people uh, who had made uh, a lot of money outside their country went back and organize projects such as these in Brazil, in Bolivia, in Argentina, and so on. So there are all kinds of precedents available which can be uh, made use of in order for the diaspora to play this kind of role. So in sum, uh, what I would like to emphasize is uh, that the South Asian diaspora is one of the richest in the world. It is, it continues to grow, it continues to amass wealth, it continues to increase the amount of money it is sending back home. It continues to change the structure of the markets in the homeland. The time has come, therefore, for this group of people, 70 million in all, to find ways of working together, not just in their own countries, but for the entire region. And if they were to do that, I've done this estimate, it was published by, in a book that ISIS sponsored, that between 2 to 2.5 percentage points of growth rate could be added to the annual increase in income in uh, the South Asian countries if there was open rate amongst these countries and if infrastructure was laid down to make all this possible. So thank you very much. Thank you, Javed. Before I open it to the questions, I want to rectify an omission on my part. When I thanked various people, I forgot to thank two important uh, 
uh, people. One is MP International. They are the event managers. They did it the last time. They've done it again. I've known this company for more than 30 years. And uh, I was reminded because their representative here, Jason, waved his fist at me from the back. <laughs> so I thought I'd better rectify that. So uh, I wanted to mention that. The other one is Weber Shadwick. They are in charge of the PR and they've done a good job so far. Hopefully they'll continue to do a good job rest of the day, rest of the time right after we get to the convention. Uh, now, having got that out of the way, 